Uh, I've always been interested in how things work. So whether it's geography or demography or politics or economics, I need to understand how the pieces fit together, which means I absorb information voraciously. And I've worked in DC for some think tanks. I worked for a private intelligence company. And now I take my insight and I spell it out for companies who are trying to figure out what's coming down the pipe. Uh, it means that I'm always absorbing from everywhere and I get a lot of migraines and when I go on vacation I have to go someplace my phone doesn't work. So in 21 days I'm going backpacking in Yosemite and I will not come out for a month. Well the world before globalization was a mosaic. Tiny little local economies and if you didn't have what you needed locally you just did without. So if you didn't have oil, you didn't industrialize. If you didn't have food, you had a very small population. And the companies, excuse me, the economies, the countries that had more would be able to use that power and leverage themselves into becoming empires. Those empires clashed, that brought us World War II, whole system collapsed. But uh, with globalization in the late 40s and 1950s, the Americans created a strategic rubric where the little guy could actually get by. And the little guy could access the inputs and the outputs of other economic systems. And so instead of thousands of tiny little systems, we eventually migrated into a single huge one where anyone could import or export anything to anyone at any time. That gave us global agriculture, that gave us global energy and finance, that gave us global manufacturing supply chains and ultimately created the world that we know. But now we're deglobalizing for a mix of reasons, and we're going back in the direction of thousands of little disconnected systems, which means that the strength of the whole is now failing. And we're seeing that with the Ukraine war, and we're seeing that with the Chinese disintegration, and we're seeing that with some of the problems that the Western world is having as they try to unplug from Russia. Uh, this is where we're all headed. Oh, the, the end of globalization is going to be a disaster for most of the world. Most of the world cannot feed and fuel itself without either direct imports or the inputs that's necessary to allow them to feed and fuel themselves from another continent. You break that down, you're talking about food shortages that are global in scale that affect billions of people. You're talking about an end to manufacturers trade in the way that we know it, which basically strangles tech in the cradle. And you're talking about a collapse of the ability of energy from one region to reach another region, which Europe is discovering right now means the lights go out. Uh, this, these are not positive things. It doesn't mean that there won't be winners, just in, as in any system, there will be winners and losers. But we've had a lot of winning in the last 75 years that's about to go away. There are two big pieces. Uh, first, globalization did not happen on accident. When uh, the, the post-World War II system was being born, the Americans proposed that we would use our Navy, the only one to survive the war, to patrol the global ocean so that anyone could gauge in any trade with anyone at any time. This is normally the sort of benefit that you would have only had if you were on the winning side of the war and you were an imperial power already. So we basically made the world open for everyone. And that allowed everyone to take manufacturing and services jobs and diversify and specialize and access anything from a world over. And once that became an option, people started taking those jobs. But all of those jobs are in the cities. And that changed who we are, because in the pre-industrial, pre-globalized world, most of us were farmers and small plot farmers at that. But once we could move into the cities and take those more value added jobs, it changed how the way we thought of families. On the, fam on the farm, kids are free labor. You have a bunch. In the city, kids are really expensive habits. You have very few. You fast forward 75 years, and it's not that we're running out of children. That happened 40 years ago in most of the world. We're now running out of adults. And so we're in a ever accelerating population crash. So even if the Americans were willing to continue a 20th century strategic policy in a world where there's no longer a Cold War, we no longer have the population structure for consumption that allows globalization to work either. So whether it's the front end or the back end, this, this period in history is now over. And it's just a question of how we segue into whatever's next. The population busts in the advanced world started in the 1950s and 60s. And that spread to the advanced developing world in the 1980s to the 2000s with Japan, I'm sorry, with, um, with China most aggressively in the 1990s. So it's just that it takes a long time. 
for for you to realize that a population i'm sorry a birth rate bust is leading to a population bust that takes 30 to 50 years well it's now been that in spades so in the entire advanced world populations are aging at the same time they are shrinking and one other thing when you industrialize for the first time you don't just get roads and rail and electricity you also get antibiotics and medical care so mortality rate collapses so China's probably the best example. They industrialized starting in the late 1980s. Their mortality rate collapsed. Their birth rate did not increase. It dropped as well. But because everyone was living longer, the population continued getting bigger. Well, you play that forward 40, 50 years. And now you've got so many people who are so old, they can no longer even have kids. So this, this population rubric belief looks at the core numbers, just sheer numbers, and by that, number for the last 40 years yeah the population has been getting bigger and bigger and more unsustainable but if you look under the hood and look at the younger generation it has been steadily vanishing now for long enough that we have run out of people of reproductive age to generate the next generation in much of the world china included and so assuming nothing else goes wrong assuming globalization holds we're still looking at a population crash so we'll probably hit, what, 8 billion next year. We'll never hit 9, and it's going to be an accelerating fall off from this point. Whew, uh, pick a topic. We can go anywhere with that one. Uh, let's start with the really unsexy one, finance. If, if you're 55, 55, 60, 64, something like that, your kids have moved home, your house has been paid down, your incomes are high, your expenses are low, you are the richest you will ever be. And then you move into retirement and you liquidate all of your investments and you go into very rote investments, things like treasury bills and cash. Because if there's ever another currency or market crash, you're out of luck, you're destitute. Well, that is now happening to the baby boomers this year. At the end of this year, that happens in most of the world. And our richest generation ever that has been providing all the financial ballast that has allowed everything to happen is going to basically take their marbles and go home. And in most of the world, there is not a generation coming up and behind them. The, uh, the Gen X generation in the United States is very small, but it's even smaller relative to the boomers in the advanced developing world, or sorry, in the advanced world. So we know that the cost of capital is going to bear minimum quadruple in the United States. It will probably increase by a factor of six to eight in most of the rest of the world, and it won't get better. Now in the United States, 10 years from now, our millennial generation, which is a large generation, will enter that capital rich demographic. But most of the rest of the world does not have a millennial generation of size. So we're gonna get this split in capital costs with the Americans going one way, the advanced world going another way, and most of the developing world never having been able to become rich enough to play their own role. So we get to do all of this in a period of multi-decade capital shortages. We don't even have an economic theory that describes what that is going to look like. Well, the United States is the first world country in the best position demographically, and in terms of structurally economically, it never invested its economy into globalization because it was a bribe. We basically created this environment so that people would be on our side versus the Soviets. So if we had invested our economy in it, we would have just been another empire, and there probably wouldn't have been all that many takers. Uh, so that means the United States can step away from this system and not suffer too much pain. France had a very similar view of globalization because they saw it as an American strategic play. They're like, oh, that's what we would have done. So, of course, they didn't invest their economy into either the globalized world or even into the European Union. They think of the EU as a strategic project, not an economic one. And so this is they invested into the European system about the same way that the Brits did. Small, late, have some regrets, never went in whole hog. But then there are countries that can attach themselves to one of those systems or maybe start up a little echo of their own. Turkey looks pretty good. Uh, Japan clearly has the military force to go out and secure the things that it needs. And it has offloaded a lot of manufacturing base into countries with better demographic structures. Argentina, despite its creative policy making, has all the inputs that it needs to be successful should it so choose. Uh, and then other countries have already managed to kind of get into the American inner circle, whether that's Mexico or Canada or Colombia or Chile. They already have the legal structure and the trade deals in place. Uh, Australia looks good because even though they're going to suffer a 
horrific recession as they adapt to some of the they've got a stable population they've got resources they've got the raw materials they've got um, an agricultural system that's hugely export oriented and they're america's best friends so you can see countries latching on to some of the more successful systems and others trying to go their own way with various degrees of success excesses of the last 30 years